Hello, I'm Steve Harden, CEO and founder of LifeWings, and welcome to another edition of the LifeWings Leadership Lab. In this edition of the lab, we're going to be discussing how to handle difficult questions and get the buy-in you need for the project, the program, or the initiative that you're leading. It's one of the most critical skills you can have as a leader because if you can't get buy-in from the people that work with you and for you, you know that your project's not going to be successful. So today we're discussing getting buy-in. Uh, honestly, it's one of the most critical skills that you can have as a leader. And uh, if you don't have good communication skills and the ability to get buy-in, it's almost leadership malpractice. Uh, you just cannot drive the organization from where it is, from point A to point B, unless you can get buy-in. Over the past 20 years, I've helped uh, implement almost 200 uh, patient safety or quality improvement projects in hospitals in the U.S. and around the world. And one of the exercises we do when we get together is to get the leadership team together and go uh, and ask, um, hey, what are the barriers to success here? If we're going to be successful on this project in this hospital in this unit, what barrier do we need to overcome? And over 20 years, the number one answer always is we have to get buy-in. If we don't get buy-in on this, we're not going to be successful. So it is one of the most important leadership skills that you possibly can have. All right, so uh, what can you do to get buy-in? How can you improve your ability to get buy-in? Well, one of the first things you need to know is uh, sort of the anatomy or the architecture of resistance, if you will. You know that in any project you have that requires change, that folks are going to be resistant. Fortunately for us, resistance to change has been studied for 40 or 50 years. One of the most useful tools that sort of explains resistance to change is called Rogers Adoption or Rogers Innovation Curve. And you can see it here on the whiteboard. So if you took the total population of folks in your organization and you plotted where they fell out in terms of resistance to change, it would look something like this. Uh, over here, all the way to the left end of the scale, you have a very small uh, group of folks uh, known as innovators. Uh, you'll have another small group known as early adopters, a big group known as early majority, then the late majority, and all the way out to the right, you'll have your laggards or your major resistors. So let's go through each one of these and, and explain uh, how they can help you or hurt you as you're trying to get buy-in for your change project. All the way out to the left are innovators. Uh, I'm going to use an Apple iPhone example to sort of explain this. Innovators would be the folks that Apple hires to beta test the new iPhone 10, right? So before they ever release it to the public, uh, they've got some folks that are so into trying new things and working with new things um, that they're going to be hired as beta, te beta testers, right? And we call those the innovators. And that's really a very small... Uh, subset of the population that you work with. But next to them is a really important group to you and that's known as the early adopters. So to use our iPhone example, an early adopter is the kind of person that spends the night in front of the Apple store to be the first person to get the new iPhone when it comes out. And uh, we'll come back to early adopters here in a second because they can be really beneficial to you as a leader. The next group is the early majority. Uh, to use our Apple iPhone example, the early majority are not going to camp out in front of the uh, Apple store to get the new iPhone when it comes out, but they will order it. Uh, they'll go down to their local AT&T store or they'll order it online within four to six weeks of, of the new phone coming out. Right? And then you have your late majority. It's another big group. Uh, to use our iPhone example, the late majority is still happy using the a Apple iPhone 5 or the iPhone 6, and they really see no, cha no reason to get an iPhone 10, right? So um, they're typically a more difficult group to convince that the change is important to make. And then all the way out to the right, you have your laggards. The laggards are the folks that are still using a Motorola flip phone. And uh, quite frankly, um, three to 8% of them, you're probably never going to convince and you'll uh, have to do quite a bit of coaching and um, have sort of career day discussions with them if you really want your change 
uh, to be successful. All right, so what the, the most useful thing out of this curve for you as a leader is to know who can help you sell the change that you're trying to make. And what the research tells us is it's the folks in the early adopter category that are the most persuasive for the early majority and the late majority. And so one of the best things you can do as a leader is to sit down and think about the folks you work with and the folks that work with the, uh, work for you and say, who are my early adopters? And this is an exercise we do in our leadership training. And uh, I'm always amazed leaders have no problem identifying who their early adopters are. Typically they can, they can name off five people in their organization, which, kind of fit the category of an early adopter. And the use for you, the, the reason this is important for you to know is that's really where you should spend your time. Identify your early adopters and go work with them, talk with them, speak with them, uh, and convince them to get on board with the change first, right? So every early adopter that you can convince that this change is important and needs to be made uh, is a real leverage point for you because uh, the research tells us that they're the most convincing to both the early and the late majority. Now, one of the mistakes I see leaders make in change initiatives is they think, well, we really shouldn't begin this until we have everybody on board, right? So we really have to go convince these laggards to get on board at the very beginning. And uh, that's a mistake. You, know, you will wear yourself out as a leader trying to convince your resistors on the front end, right? So your best bet to spend all of your initial energy identifying your early adopters, uh, getting them on board, and then uh, supporting them as they go convince the early and late majority. And honestly, your laggards are not going to be convinced until you have the early majority and some of the late majority on board. So it's this groundswell of support that ultimately convinces uh, the laggards, right? When I was a, a fighter pilot in the Navy, we had a saying, never wrestle with a pig. Uh, you wake up covered in mud and you realize that the pig really enjoyed the battle. And honestly, a lot of folks that fall into this laggard category or uh, resistor category, um, they enjoy that battle. They enjoy arguing with you. They enjoy being known as a resistor. Uh, they enjoy the verbal sparring. And you're gonna wear yourself out with all that verbal sparring in the beginning and realize you really didn't convince them and uh, you woke up covered in mud and they really enjoyed the battle. So never wrestle with a pig. Spend most of your initial efforts here building your champions, building your raving fans, because that's what's going to give you um, the biggest bang for the buck from your initial energy trying to uh, move your project forward. The next thing I'd like to talk about are the five P's. Perfect practice produces perfect performance. Listen, you know you're going to have resistance, right? And you know people are going to ask you difficult questions. And it's leadership malpractice, really, not to be prepared for those difficult questions, which you know you're going to get. After 20 years of doing this kind of work, we've identified about 10 questions that come up over and over and over again. So you'll hear things like, uh, why are we spending money on this when we could buy new equipment or we could uh, hire new staff? Um, why do I have to do this? I don't have bad quality outcomes already. Why don't you give this program or force this program on folks that are struggling with quality? Or I've never heard a patient. You know, why do I have to do team steps training? Why don't you give this to people that have been involved in serious safety events? You know, so it's questions like that. And you know you're going to get them, right? So since you know you're going to get them, you ought to practice a response to them. Probably the best example of being prepared to answer a difficult question that I've ever seen actually happened during uh, the time President Reagan was uh, president and he was coming up at the end of his first term and was going to run for a second term. And, you know, back then they did just like they do today. They had presidential debates. So his um, uh, opponent uh, for his second term was Walter Mondale, and in their first debate, Walter Mondale did really very well. Uh, Mondale was a great debater. He was actually much younger than President Reagan at the time. 
Uh, President Reagan was uh, one of the oldest presidents ever, and there was a lot of concern about whether or not he was too old to be president. And, he, and quite frankly, he didn't do very well in his first debate uh, with Walter Mondale. So in the time between debate one and debate two, uh, all of the editorials and all of the talking heads on television were batting about the question, is President Reagan too old to be president, right? Um, especially when you uh, put him next to Walter Mondale and you saw the difference in, uh, in age and, and youth. And um, so the team that works for uh, President Reagan to prepare him for the debate, what question did you think they were going to get in the second debate? Are you too old to be president? And in fact, when the second debate started, that was the very first question that the moderate, the, the debate moderator asked. He said, hey, President Reagan, a lot of people have been talking about your age and there's a lot of folks that say you may be too old to be president. And uh, you know, how do you respond to that? Well, he knew he was going to get that difficult question and they practiced the five Ps. I'm sure they got together and gave that question to President Reagan in the run-up and the practice sessions for the debate. It was the first question he got and he knocked it out of the park. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you what he said. Uh, it's one of the classic line, debate lines of all time. Uh, there actually is a link to a YouTube video of that debate. It's in this post. I encourage you to go see it. It's the perfect example of knowing the kinds of questions you're gonna get and being prepared to answer those questions. And you should do that too, all right? Honestly, if you're not doing that, uh, you're not uh, striving to be all you can be as a leader because you're not gonna get the buy-in you need to be successful in moving the organization from point A to point B until you're able to get buy-in and typically the questions and the resistance to buy-in are, are really similar. So you should practice your answers to that. Okay, so the action step for this particular lab is to think about some initiative or some project you've got going on in your organization uh, that you're struggling with and uh, think about the difficult questions, the type of pushback that you're getting. And so my action step for you is to sit down and write down two or three questions, difficult questions that you've either already gotten or you know you're gonna get and then uh, formulate a thoughtful response to that. And, um, and then practice, practice saying it. Uh, get one of your colleagues to do a dry run with you to actually ask you that question and you practice the response to it and get some feedback uh, from your colleague on how you handle it, right? So perfect practice produces perfect performance. You know you're gonna get the questions, write those questions down, formulate your answers, do some dry runs with your colleagues and make sure that you can give a well thought out, articulate and perfect response to the difficult questions you're going to get. If you'd like to go deeper, I highly recommend a book by John Cotter called Buy-In. Uh, it's a fabulous um, instructional manual on how to handle difficult questions, how to formulate your thoughts and handling different questions. It gives you a lot of the standard questions you're gonna get about change initiatives and uh, gives you a lot of uh, blueprints for how to answer those questions that really ought to be in your leadership library. If you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the channel. Please leave your comments. If there are others of your colleagues who are um, going through particularly difficult change projects and could benefit from uh, the information here, please share it, please like it. Um, remember, getting buy-in is one of the most important skills you can have as a leader. And uh, so work on your questions, work on your responses, and I wish you every success on your leadership journey. Until next time.